the brother of King Henry VIII, Arthur Tudor, Prince of Wales. Henry VII rose to power in England following his victory over Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. To strengthen his claim to the throne, Henry and his royal advisers traced his ancestry back to ancient British rulers. In a symbolic move, they named his first son after the legendary King Arthur and identified Camlet as present-day Winchester. Henry's wife, Elizabeth of York, gave birth to their son in Winchester, further cementing the connection to Arthurian legend. Now, let's explore the life of Arthur Tudor, the Prince of Wales. Arthur was born on the 20th of September 1486 at St Swithin's Prairie as the eldest child of Henry and Elizabeth. He symbolised the unity between the House of Tudor and the House of York, marking the end of the Wars of Roses. Arthur also inherited the title of Duke of Cornwall at birth. His baptism at Winchester Cathedral was confirmation by Bishop John Alcock, marked his formal entry into the royal family. Notable figures such as John de Vere, Thomas Stanley and Queen Elizabeth Woodville were among his godparents. Initially, Arthur was cared for by Elizabeth Darcy, who had previously served Edward IV's children. Upon becoming Prince of Wales in 1490, Arthur had his own household, reflecting his royal status. Henry VII and Elizabeth had six more children, but only Margaret, Henry and Mary survived to adulthood. Arthur shared a strong bond with his siblings, especially Margaret and Henry. Arthur's journey into knighthood began in 1489, when he was made a Knight of the Bath. He was formally appointed Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester in 1490 at the Palace of Westminster. His ceremony included a grand procession down the River Thames and Arthur was also inducted into the Order of the Garter at St George's Chapel in Windsor Palace in 1491. Alongside his formal education, Arthur excelled in activities like archery and dance under esteemed tutors. By 1501, it was widely believed that Arthur's supposed frail health, which had been discussed since 1502, was actually a misunderstanding of a letter from that year. However, there are no contemporary accounts of Arthur being in poor health. As he grew up, Arthur was recognised for his remarkably tall stature for his age and was considered handsome by the Spanish court. He bore a resemblance to his brother Henry, known for his striking looks, sharing features like reddish hair, small eyes and a prominent nose. Despite being perceived as delicate overall, Arthur's friendly and gentle nature garnered him admiration. In May 1490, Arthur was appointed as a warden, responsible for the security of the border between England and Scotland overseeing all the marches towards Scotland, with the Earl of Surrey acting as his deputy. He began participating in peace commissions from 1491, and when his father travelled to France in October 1492, Arthur took on the duties of Keeper of England and King's Lieutenant. Following the example of Edward IV, Henry VII established a Council of Wales and the marches to assert royal authority in the area appointing Arthur as its leader. Although the council had been created in 1490, Jasper Tudor, the Duke of Bedford, formally headed it. Arthur was sent to Wales in 1501, at the age of 15, to further consolidate royal control. In March 1493, Arthur was granted the authority to appoint justices of Oya and Termina, empowering the council to handle legal matters and investigate franchises. He received support from members of the English, Irish and Welsh nobility, including Gerald Fitzherald, the ninth Earl of Kildare, who had been brought to the English court due to his father's involvement in the crowning of Lambert Simnel during Henry VII's reign. Regarding marriage, Henry VII intended to strengthen the Anglo-Spanish alliance against France by marrying Arthur to a daughter of the Catholic monarchs, Isabella I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon. Catherine, the youngest daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella, was proposed as a suitable match for Arthur. The Treaty of Medina de Campo in March 1489 
outlined their marriage once they reached marriageable age, with Catherine's dowry set at 200,000 crowns. The marriage was granted in February 1497, and a proxy marriage took place on the 25th of August. Two years later, a formal proxy marriage was conducted at Arthur's Tickenhill Manor in Budley, near Worcester. In a letter from October 1499, Arthur expressed his deep affection for Catherine, eagerly anticipating their union and referring to her as his beloved spouse. Until the 20th of September 1501, Arthur and Catherine communicated in Latin. But upon turning 15, Arthur was considered old enough for marriage. Catherine arrived in England on the 2nd of October and they met for the first time on November the 4th at Dogmas Field in Hampshire. Despite Arthur's pledge to be a devoted husband, they faced difficulties in understanding each other due to differences in their Latin pronunciation. Despite these linguistic hurdles, Catherine arrived in London on the 9th of November. The wedding took place on the 14th, 1501, at St Paul's Cathedral, with both adorned in white satin. The ceremony was conducted by Henry Dean, Archbishop of Canterbury. The newlyweds were then entertained at Baynard's Castle. Following the ceremony, a traditional bedding ceremony organised by Arthur's grandmother, Lady Margaret, took place. Catherine was led to the bridal chamber, where she was prepared and placed in bed, joined by Arthur. After a month at Tickenhall Manor, Arthur and Catherine moved to Ludlow Castle in Wales. Despite initial reluctance from Henry VII, Catherine was ordered to join Arthur. Under Arthur's governance, Wales experienced peace, yet tragedy struck in March 1502 when they both fell ill. Catherine recovered, but Arthur passed away on the 2nd of April 1502. Arthur's death deeply affected Henry VII, who summoned his wife for solace. Elizabeth was overwhelmed with grief, as seen during the procession for Arthur's soul salvation on the 8th of April and the subsequent services in London. Arthur's body was transported to Worcester Cathedral on the 25th of April, with Catherine not attending the funeral. Discussions arose about betrothing Catherine to the new heir, Henry, with the Pope granting a dispensation. Henry VIII ascended the throne on the 22nd of April 1509 and married Catherine on the 11th of June. They had six children, but only Mary survived. Despite Henry's later desire to annul the marriage, Catherine maintained her innocence. Arthur's premature death marked the beginning of significant changes, with Henry VIII's reign altering England's course. Despite Arthur's brief life, his legacy remains shrouded in mystery, leaving many historians with many unanswered questions. The sister of Henry VIII, Mary Tudor. This woman's life was full of royal intrigue, diplomatic manoeuvres and unwavering defiance. Born amidst the grandeur of the Tudor era in 1496, she stood as the younger sister of Henry VIII and the cherished daughter of Henry VII. With both regal lineage and striking beauty at her disposal, she effortlessly captivated the courts of Europe. At the tender age of 18, she found herself wedded to the 52-year-old King Louis XII of France, a union orchestrated for political purposes only. Yet her reign as Queen of France was fleeting, overshadowed by the untimely death of Louis XII merely three months into their marriage, leaving her a very young widow. Undeterred by conventions, she followed her heart and defied royal expectations by marrying her true love, Charles Brandon, the Duke of Suffolk, without the consent of her powerful brother, Henry VIII. In a world where monarchs held sway and courtly etiquette reigned supreme, she forged her own path marked by passion and resilience, cementing her status as one of the most intriguing figures of the Tudor era. Let us delve into the extraordinary life of Mary Tudor, Queen of France, whose journey began on the 18th of March 1496 in the regal chambers of Sheen Palace. As a young surviving offspring of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, her arrival was heralded by historical documents authorising payments to her nurse, Anne Skerham. 
renowned scholar Ramus also attested to her early years, recalling her veracity as a spirited four-year-old. By the age of six, Mary's royal standing warranted an extensive entourage, including tutors, attendants and a personal physician. Her education was comprehensive, spanning languages, music, dance and needlework under the tutelage of her devoted governess. Mary shared a special bond with her brother, the future Henry VIII, who honoured her by naming his first surviving child after her destined to become Queen Mary I. Their childhood was marked by shared grief following the loss of their mother when Mary was just six years old. Renowned for her exceptional beauty, Mary garnered admiration across Europe, with the Ramers declaring her unmatched by nature's hand. Her talents in music and dance further enhanced her allure, captivating audiences during gatherings and visits from dignitaries such as Philip I of Castile. Following the tragic death of Philip I, Mary's betrothal to his son, Charles, the future Holy Roman Emperor, was abruptly ended in 1513. However, Cardinal Wolsey, a skilled diplomat, orchestrated a surprising marital alliance through negotiations with France, altering the course of Mary's life once again. On the 9th of October 1514, an 18-year-old Mary took her solemn steps down the aisle to unite in marriage with a considerably older 52-year-old King Louis XII of France. Accompanying her were four English maids of honour, including Mary Boleyn, all overseen by her former governess turned principal lady-in-waiting, Lady Guildford. Louis, driven by the desire for a male heir after failing to have any from his previous marriages, found himself bound to Mary. However, their union was short-lived as Louis succumbed to death on the 1st of January 1515, just three months into their marriage. Speculation surrounded the cause of his demise, with some attributing it to his vigorous efforts in the bedchamber, while others suspected it was due to his crippling gout. Regardless, the marriage bore no children. Following Louis's passing, King Francis I attempted in vain to arrange a second marriage for the widowed Mary. Her heart, however, belonged to Charles Brandon, the first Duke of Suffolk. Despite the political nature of her marriage to Louis XII, her brother, King Henry VIII, was aware of Mary's feelings and even had his own designs for her future alliances. In 1515 correspondence, Mary expressed her conditional agreement to marry Louis XII, stipulating her right to choose her next husband should she outlive him. However, Henry VIII had his own political aspirations and his council opposed the potential union between Mary and Charles Brandon due to fears of Brandon's growing influence at court. Amidst these challenges, Mary navigated the complex landscape of court politics, deflecting marriage proposals from various suitors including Antoine, Duke of Lorraine, and Charles III, Duke of Savoy as well as tactfully evading King Francis I's interests. Despite warnings from French friars regarding Brandon's character, Mary remained steadfast in her affection for him. Love eventually triumphed when Henry VIII sent Brandon to escort Mary back to England in January 1515, extracting a promise from Brandon not to propose marriage. However, Mary, tearful and persuasive, convinced Charles to break his oath, and they secretly wed at the Hotel de Cluny in Paris on the 3rd of March 1515, witnessed by only ten individuals, including King Francis I. This clandestine marriage incurred the wrath of Henry VIII, as Brandon had married a royal princess without his consent. This was an act of treason. Initially facing severe punishment including execution, the intervention of Cardinal Wolsey and Henry's affection for his sister and Charles spared them, albeit with a hefty fine of £24,000. The union of Mary and Charles Brandon was formalised at Greenwich Palace on the 13th of May 1515 and later received approval from Pope Clement VII in 1528, thus legitimising their marriage. 
Embracing her role as a stepmother, Mary cared for Charles's two daughters from his previous marriage, seamlessly integrating them into their new family dynamic. Throughout her second marriage, Mary was often referred to as the Queen of France at the English court, a title reflective of her royal lineage. Residing primarily at Westhorpe Hall in Suffolk, Mary faced new challenges as she opposed her brother's attempts to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon, whom Mary had known and respected for many years. Additionally, her dislike for Anne Boleyn, Henry's intended wife, strained their relationship further. Tensions escalated in March 1532 when a confrontation at Westminster resulted in the death of Sir William Pennington, allegedly stemming from derogatory remarks about Anne Boleyn, which were made by Mary. These incidents underscored the intricate complexities of royal court and the intrigues into Mary's life. Despite her royal status, Mary's life was shadowed by illness, requiring ongoing medical care. Her health declined steadily and at the age of 37, she passed away at Westhorpe Hall on the 25th of June 1533, never fully recovering from the sweating sickness that she contracted in 1528. The exact cause of her death remains a matter of speculation, with possibilities ranging from angina to tuberculosis, appendicitis or cancer. Mary's funeral was a grand affair, befitting her royal lineage. She lay in state at Westhorpe Hall for three weeks before a solemn mass was held at Westminster Abbey in her honour. On the 22nd of July 1533, dignitaries from England and France attended her grand funeral ceremony, led by her daughter Frances. Notably absent were Mary's husband and her royal brother, the King. The funeral procession included a hundred torchbearers, clerics, nobility and a hundred of the Duke's yeomen, culminating in Mary's interment at Bury St Edmund's Abbey the following day. An unexpected controversy arose as her stepdaughters Anne and Mary took the lead in the procession just before her coffin's descent into the Abbey's crypt, much to the disdain of their half-siblings. Mary's remains were later moved to St Mary's Church, Bury St Edmunds, after the dissolution of the monastery in 1538. A turn of events in 1784, her coffin was opened and locks of her hair were taken as souvenirs by curious individuals. Despite her passing, Mary Tudor's legacy endures as a woman who defied convention and asserted her desires in a world dominated by the whims of kings. Her story serves as a reminder of the enduring power of the human spirit in the face of adversity, marking her as one of the most remarkable figures of the Tudor era. The Life of Henry VIII's Sister, Margaret Tudor Welcome to the compelling narrative of a historical figure whose life often remains in the shadows, Margaret Tudor, the elder sister of Henry VIII. The Scottish crowds eagerly awaited their new queen as she approached Edinburgh in the summer of 1503, a 13-year-old English princess trained for her royal role. Amidst the excitement fuelled in part by generous drinks, there was a palpable sense of optimism in Scotland. King James, with seven illegitimate children, sought a legitimate heir and valued the diplomatic advantage of his English wife. Margaret Tudor, the daughter of King Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York, embarked on a journey to enhance Scotland's prestige. Despite being less discussed among the Tudors, Margaret's extensive correspondence with her family in England, starting in August 1503, reveals her homesickness and insecurities. In one heartfelt letter to her father, she expressed a wish to be with him seeking comfort and well-treatment for those left behind. Henry was determined to showcase the Tudor dynasty's power through Margaret's presence in Scotland. She became a constant spectacle, engaging with local dignitaries, attending banquets and donning splendid gowns as she entered towns along her route. Margaret, a slim and red-headed figure, made her entrance into Scotland on August the 1st, meeting her husband at Dalkeith Castle, 
this historical journey sheds light on the often overlooked life of Margaret Tudor. A short while later, James meticulously orchestrated the upcoming visit. Renowned for his charming and womanising ways, he knew precisely how to put his new bride at ease. As evident from Margaret's letters, despite any potential lack of full appreciation on her part, Margaret joined him on horseback as he entered Edinburgh, delighting the crowds. Guiding her through official functions with a protective arm around her waist, James ensured their wedding was extravagant. A significant portion of his annual income was allocated to the festivities, including matching outfits for the couple. Despite the grandeur, Margaret felt a lingering sense that James didn't devote enough time to her. He preferred discussing military matters with the Earl of Surrey, whose dictatorial manner she resented. Worried about the long-term treatment she and her servants might receive, Margaret expressed her frustration in a furious letter to her brother, Henry VIII, in 1513. She lamented the unkind treatment and expected recompense for their husband's sake. Despite her initial concerns, Margaret's subsequent letters, written about a decade after her arrival in Scotland, reveal that her fears about life north of the border were ultimately unfounded. She adapted swiftly and established herself firmly as Scotland's queen, adorned in rich furs and gowns, and surrounded by the lavish attention lavished upon her by James. Though James was not entirely faithful, Margaret remained unaware of his favourite mistress, Janet Kennedy, being pregnant with their third child at the time of their wedding. Despite challenges, James proved a considerate husband, easing Margaret into her roles as consort and mother, leading to the birth of a prince, although the child did not survive. The Queen co-led alongside her husband a sophisticated court where James's reign witnessed a flourishing of literature and the arts in Scotland. The royal couple shared a passion for music, dancing and balls. Margaret soon recognised that she had married a capable and popular ruler in James, a polymorph with diverse interests ranging from naval matters to dentistry. Committed to establishing himself as a key player in Europe, James's policies, however, led to conflict with his young brother-in-law, Henry, in England. The discord may have originated in a reported childish spat where Queen Margaret briefly took precedence over Henry. Henry's refusal to provide Margaret with the money and possessions left by her father and brother, Prince Arthur Tudor, left her furious. The situation worsened as England declared war on France and James decided to invade England, a move that Margaret's opposition did not hinder. Tragedy struck 18 months later when James engaged in Battle of Flodden in September 1513. Despite outnumbering the English and boasting advanced military technology, James, inexperienced in commanding a large force, faced slaughter on a remote hillside in Northumberland. 10,000 Scots, including the king himself, perished, leaving Margaret a widow at the tender age of 23. In her subsequent letter, Margaret expressed profound anxiety for both her own life and well-being of her children. Dating in 1514, she detailed ongoing adversity, describing malice in their actions and misuse of the king's authority in their parliament. Feeling as if she and her lords were stripped of reputation and labelled as rebels, she urgently implored her brother to expedite military support by sea and land for the welfare of herself and her children. Margaret, though shocked by her husband's death, exhibited remarkable composure and resolution. Taking swift action, she ensured her son's safety by bringing him to Stirling House, where he was crowned king on September 21st. Named regent in accordance with her late husband's will, Margaret faced a condition, no remarriage. However, being an English woman in a patriarchal Scotland made wielding power challenging. Despite giving birth to another son in April 1514, her subsequent marriage to the Earl of Angus marked a significant misjudgment. The decision, influenced by the need for a strong male figure, cost Margaret her regency, plunging her into a period of prolonged faction fighting. 
Desperate to protect her children and retain power, Margaret sought help from her brother, King Henry VIII, but to no avail. The Duke of Albany, through might and power, seized her tender children, removed her from her castle and compelled her to renounce her office of regent. By 1516, Margaret, denouncing Albany, had fled to England, where she gave birth to her final child, a daughter named Lady Margaret Douglas, announcing the child's arrival to the Scottish regent. As a young lady, Margaret Tudor penned a letter in October 1515 from Harbottle Castle in Northumberland. Her son, King James V, was a significant figure in her life. Margaret's words in the letter reflected the profound depth of her anguish. John Stuart, Duke of Albany, was James's cousin and the next in line to the Scottish throne after James V. Born and raised in France, he had a limited knowledge of Scotland. Initially finding Albany charming, Margaret's position was further undermined by Henry VIII's attempt to have her sons kidnapped and brought to England as he sought to rule Scotland justly. Realising the need to gain control of the royal children, Albany besieged Stirling Castle when Margaret refused. In a dramatic gesture, the Queen was forced to submit, intending to reinforce her son's authority as King. Margaret, displaying Tudor flair for public occasions, decided that fighting was the only option in September 1515. Heavily pregnant and leaving all of her belongings behind, she rode to the English border with Angus, marking the last time her second husband would assist her. Despite the arrival of new dresses from London, her world truly fell apart with the death of Margaret's youngest son in December. In search of solace, Margaret turned to her sister Mary and brother Henry VIII, who had been separated for 13 years. Though Henry treated her well, he insisted that Margaret's place was in Scotland, taking Lady Margaret Douglas, his daughter, with him. The Earl of Angus fled to France and then to England. Raised at the English court, Lady Margaret knew little about her mother. In 1524, Albany returned to France, marked as a potential resurgence for Queen Margaret. Wanting a divorce and unwilling to share power with Angus, she fired the guns of Edinburgh Castle on him in 1525. However, Angus outmaneuvered fellow politicians, gaining control of the king for three years. James V, discontent with his stepfather's restrictions, and Margaret, pursuing her divorce campaign, faced challenges. In 1527, Margaret's marriage to Angus was annulled by the Pope, coinciding with the commencement of Henry VIII's divorce proceedings against Catherine of Aragon. The following Easter, James V broke free from the defamation of the Douglases and Angus fled to England. Margaret was elated, having fallen in love with a member of her household, Henry Stuart. At the age of 39, she desired to marry again, and although her son gave his permission, he extracted a high price, forbidding Margaret's future meddling in Scottish politics. Feeling sidelined and increasingly aggrieved, the Queen's third marriage proved as unsuccessful as her union with Angus. Henry Stuart exploited her financially and was unfaithful. Relief and a sense of fulfilment unexpectedly came from Mary of Guise, James V's second wife. The attractive and clever French noblewoman paid due attention to Margaret and the old Queen spent more time at court. In 1541, tragedy struck when Margaret's two grandsons died within days of each other, leaving their parents devastated. Although Margaret's support was greatly appreciated during this desperate time, her own life was drawing to a close. In October 1541, she suffered a stroke at Metham Castle, outside Perth, and died before her son could reach her. She was buried at St John's Abbey in the city alongside her other Scottish rulers. During the Reformation, Margaret's tomb was desecrated and her skeleton was burned, likely due to her English and Catholic background, reminiscent of her first husband, James. She lacks a monument, but she would likely have been pleased that her great-grandson, James, united the crowns of England and Scotland in 1603. The Tragic Life of Henry VIII's Sister In a distant era, the Tudor dynasty emerged, 
bringing an end to the War of Roses. England had endured years of internal strife as the Houses of York and Lancaster vied for the throne. The turning point came when Richard III fell in battle, paving the way for Henry Tudor to ascend as Henry VII, marking the inception of the notorious Tudor dynasty in English history. The Tudor reign witnessed significant transformations, including the execution of queens within the Tower of London, religious upheavals and the influence of one man's infatuation at court. Mary I, known for burning numerous Protestants, contrasts sharply with the widely acclaimed Queen Elizabeth I, who triumphed over the Spanish Armada. The unification of England occurred through the marriage of Henry VII to Elizabeth of York. Despite their royal status, the couple faced profound losses, particularly concerning their offspring. The demise of their prominent son, Arthur, the Prince of Wales, and the forgotten tragedy of a three-year-old princess at Elton Palace underscore the sorrowful chapters in Tudor history. Born in Richmond Palace, later rebuilt as Sheen Palace by Henry VII, Elizabeth Tudor, the second daughter of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, held promise in her early years. Royal marriages were strategic tools for alliance building, exemplified by Henry VII's match between Arthur and Catherine of Aragon. Elizabeth Tudor's story unfolds against the backdrop of Tudor England's intricate tapestry, revealing both celebrated triumphs and lesser-known tragedies. In the 16th century, Spain emerged as a formidable threat to England, evolving into one of the largest empires during the Age of Exploration. The strategic marriage of an English heir to a Spanish princess aimed at fostering peace between the two nations, envisioning a period of stability. Meanwhile, Elizabeth Tudor, it was anticipated, might have wedded a French or other European prince to safeguard England from potential invasions. However, this hopeful scenario never materialised. Growing up in the royal nursery at the royal court under the care of Cecily Burbage, her wet nurse, Elizabeth experienced a nurturing environment. Two nurseries were established for Henry and Elizabeth's children, including Elsing Palace. Elizabeth of York, her mother, actively participated in their upbringing, dispelling any notion of distance. Tragedy struck on the 14th of September 1495, when Princess Elizabeth, the second daughter of the King and Queen, passed away at Elton Palace in Kent. At the time, her parents were away at Sheen Palace, making her sudden demise particularly shocking. Princess Elizabeth's illness, initially believed to be recoverable, ultimately claimed her life. Her parents were not summoned, indicating the unexpected nature of her death. At the time of her passing, Elizabeth of York was carrying another daughter, intensifying the grief. The funeral arrangements undertaken by the royal household saw a grand procession and burial inside Westminster Abbey, specifically in Henry VII's Lady Chapel. Despite Henry VII's reputation for thriftiness, he allocated a substantial sum, around £318, for the funeral, a significant amount in today's terms. The King and Queen's absence at the funeral was customary for the time. Princess Elizabeth's tomb, a small marble chest with a black marble slab, was placed near the heart of Westminster Abbey, in front of the great shrine of Edward the Confessor. Over time, the inscription of her tomb has eroded, contributing to the loss of her memorial to the passage of time. The inscription on Princess Elizabeth's tomb reportedly conveyed that she was the second child of Henry VII, King of England, France and Ireland, and Queen Elizabeth. Born on the 2nd of July 1492, she departed on the 14th of September 1495. A plea for mercy upon her soul was included in the inscription. Another plate on the feet of her effigy bore a translated message lamenting the untimely death of the young and noble Elizabeth, the daughter of the illustrious Prince Henry VII. The severe messenger of death, Atropos, was said to have snatched her away, but the wish for eternal life in heaven was expressed. The year following Elizabeth's death saw the birth of her daughter, Mary, who later became known as Mary Tudor, the Queen of France. 
Sadly, the royal couple experienced the loss of their final two children, with Edmund passing away at around 15 months old in 1500, and Catherine dying shortly after birth in 1503. It is believed that Elizabeth of York, the Queen, also died shortly after childbirth with Catherine. Despite being a forgotten Tudor princess, Elizabeth Tudor's premature death left the royal family grieving for a potentially long and prosperous life that she may have led. The family had hoped that she would marry a European ruler to secure alliances, wealth and peace for England. Her brother, Henry VIII, would later become the notorious Tudor king with six wives, driven by the quest for a male heir. The king's pursuit of a male heir led to marriages, divorces and executions of his wives. Elizabeth, his sister, would have been a prominent princess and ally during his reign, but she unfortunately passed away at the age of three. The overlooked brother of King Henry VIII. During the Tudor era, childbirth posed significant risks for both the mother and the child. Numerous notable individuals such as Catherine Parr and Elizabeth of York tragically passed away shortly after the birth. It was distressingly common for infants to fall ill and perish in their early stages of life, which caused immense sorrow for the parents. One such overlooked figure is Edmund, the forgotten Tudor prince and younger brother of Henry VIII. Securing heirs, particularly sons, was crucial for Tudor monarchs like Henry VII and Henry VIII to ensure the continuation of their dynasties. Henry VIII's relentless pursuit of a male heir led to very drastic actions, including the execution of his second wife, Anne Boleyn. Despite being a fertile couple, Elizabeth of York and Henry VII experienced the heartbreak of losing children in infancy, including Edmund, the Duke of Somerset. In the summer of 1497, after the birth of Princess Mary Tudor, Queen Elizabeth embarked on a pilgrimage in the hopes of conceiving another royal child with her husband. However, at the age of 33, her chances of pregnancy were reduced in Tudor England. The kingdom faced instability due to uprisings and, and even a fire at Cheen Palace in the Christmas of 1497. Despite these challenges, by May of the following year, Queen Elizabeth was pregnant once again. She received the best medical care available at the time, but the pregnancy was very difficult on her. Following tradition, Elizabeth entered confinement at Greenwich Palace in February 1499. Surrounded by her closest attendants, she gave birth to a healthy son, the sixth child of Henry VII and Elizabeth, on the 21st of February 1499. After the birth, the Queen experienced a complication, possibly childbed fever, causing concern for her husband. However, she managed to recover and the announcement of the new prince's birth was met with widespread celebration across England, marked by very grand ceremonies. The baptism took place on the 24th of February at the Church of the Observant Friars near Greenwich Palace, with a silver front brought from Canterbury Cathedral. Lavish decorations adorned the church, commemorating this historic event, and the baby was named Edmund after his grandfather, Edmund Tudor, Earl of Richmond. Margaret, the child's godmother, bestowed a significant sum of £100 upon him, along with financial rewards for the nurses and midwife. Shortly after his birth, Edmund was granted the Duke of Somerset, a title previously held by members of the Beaufort family. This title would later be inherited by Edward Seymour, Lord Protector of Henry VIII's son, Edward VI. Edmund spent his early days in the royal nursery at Elton Palace alongside his siblings Margaret, Mary and Henry, the future Henry VIII. Despite the privileged upbringing, tragedy struck in the summer of 1500 with a deadly plague outbreak in England. To safeguard the children, including Edmund, they were relocated from Alton Palace to the more remote Old Palace at Hatfield in Hertfordshire, while their parents travelled to Calais. The palace, a large red brick structure, served as a temporary refuge from the plague. 
However, on the 16th of June, upon the King and Queen's return to England, they received devastating news. Prince Edmund had passed away at Hatfield. The cause of his death remains uncertain, possibly due to an illness like the plague or cot death, which was sudden infant death syndrome. The grieving royal couple spared no expense in arranging for his burial. Records indicate that £242 was allocated for Prince Edmund's burial. He received a grand state funeral with his small body interred in a new chest adorned with white damask and a red velvet cross, along with his effigy and princely circlet. The coffin, accompanied by the effigy, was transported from Hatfield to London in a chariot, draped in black cloth, drawn by six horses, which were also adorned with the same black cloth. Edward Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham, led the procession as chief mourner, followed by nobles and lords with torchbearers lighting the route. The Lord Mayor of London and thousands of citizens lined the streets to pay their respects. King Henry, dressed in mourning attire, awaited the coffin at Westminster Abbey, possibly accompanied by the Queen. The coffin was solemnly brought into the abbey on a hearse, where monks and lords maintained vigil over it. Mass was held on the 22nd of June, and the coffin was laid to rest inside the confessor's chapel at Westminster Abbey. Unfortunately, there is no record or monument or tomb marking Edward's burial site. Edmund Tudor, the Overlook Tudor Prince and son of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, met a tragic and abrupt end. It's likely that the royal family held high hopes for his future, envisioning him as a prosperous prince who would support his brother's reign and forge alliances through marriage. His untimely death was undoubtedly a profound loss for Henry VII and Elizabeth, foreshadowing further tragedy. Within two years of Edmund's passing, Elizabeth of York fell gravely ill following childbirth and succumbed to complications inside the Tower of London. Her death shattered the king, adding to his already significant burden of grief and loss in the early 16th century.